Professor Prelinger, uh, as usual, so we will record your presentation. Right, and uh, is that all right? It's not a good moment, but. Okay. <laughs> and, uh, okay. And uh, is that all right? No. Okay, shall we start right now? People are still coming, but uh, this is uh, one o'clock, so it's better to start right now. And uh, some kind of the announcement. Uh, we will have the uh, three people's lectures. And also around the one thirty or two o'clock, the coffee will be served outside. So if you need coffee, please take the, it uh, individually around the 1.30 or so, okay? And today might be the uh, third part of the Grand Design Project 3. This is uh, one credit course for the KBS uh, business school student. And also it is uh, based on the Mirai Sendo Chiasip Keio University and uh, Daiwa Security Companies kindly uh, donated the fund to support this program. And uh, this is an official uh, ex official statement of my thanks to diver security companies. And uh, today, it's for, today might be the forum uh, inviting three uh, speakers. And the title is Technological Innovation in Global Perspectives. The subtitle is Crisis, Sustainability, and Health. And the first speaker, Professor Helmut Bledinger, he is a frequent uh, visitor to this program, and he made uh, two speech already. But uh, he is now uh, doing ex uh, experiment at Okutama uh, by flying a drone. And he is, the background is uh, artificial intelligence. So AI and drone, uh, might be the today's uh, title of the uh, lecture. And the second part is Miss uh, Yumiko Nishimura. Uh, she is based on San Francisco area, California. And uh, she came all the way from the United States to Japan. And uh, this is a variable moment for us to introduce her to you. And uh, she will uh, speak about what's going on in the United States about health and IT and business. So this might be the second lecture. Third lecture is uh, Dr. Kazuhiro Sakurada. Uh, he is working for the Riken, uh, uh, Rikaga Kenkyu Show, and also he is working for Sony computer laboratories, and he is doing extensive work on the new type of uh, medical service uh, in Japan. So he is a pioneer in this field. So three interesting lectures are waiting for us. And uh, is that all right? So that is a, a brief uh, introduction. And uh, shall we start the professor? Pradinga's lecture. Could, could you help to switch the computer?
All right, yeah, thank you very much, uh, dear Anegawa Sensei, for having me here again. Uh, as you already mentioned, I have been here before and had the opportunity to promote our work on unmanned aerial vehicles and uh, the drones in, in Oktama. And today I am happy to be here again because this is maybe the first time I can show the more concrete, tangible results we uh, achieved on uh, deep learning. So this is my today's topic, deep learning creation of a dynamic map uh, by drone. And it might fit uh, somewhat uh, to the <coughs> crisis uh, topic here. Now, let me start with Nambusen. <laughs> I don't know whether you take uh, Nambusen, but uh, Nambusen has an interesting ad uh, by Toyota, and it says, we want engineers from Nambu line area more than from Silicon Valley. And I think this is a quite astonishing statement. Uh, first of all, uh, Toyota is not well known for the making the very aggressive uh, marketing. And second of all, it, it highlights uh, the need for IT people, people who know about artificial intelligence, specifically uh, deep learning, now also in, in Japan. Japan has a history, uh, proven uh, success in, in me mechanical engineering, uh, uh, cars, automotive, and, and so on, but maybe a little bit a lack uh, of IT specialists, at least judging uh, from this ad in uh, the Nambusen. Now, the topic is uh, deep learning. What's deep learning? Deep learning uh, refers to a set of algorithms uh, that try to create and learn a, a hierarchy of concepts where more upper level concepts are defined uh, from lower level concepts. So typically you have uh, such kind of a neural network. This is the, such a connected graph and you can imagine the lowest level could be pixels. If we, we talk about image recognition could be pixels and from these pixels you want to learn very primitive elementary shapes and from these shapes, you, you walk up uh, the hierarchy and you might, in case of cars, identify wheels and, and other parts and move up all the way where you can actually uh, uh, identify uh, cars. So this is a, a representation learning where we can automatically learn higher level concepts from lower level concepts, very primitive ones. Now, uh, a very well-known uh, example is the Google Cat. <coughs> so uh, Google, as, as you know, has a rich computational uh, resources. And also, they have all these videos uh, from YouTube. So what they did is they created this huge network, neural network, and put a lot of YouTube videos into it and let it train. Now, the, the interesting thing is that over time, there was a, a node popping up, it looked like this. So the neural network doesn't know it's a cat, but we look at it and we know it's a cat. So apparently from this huge amount of uh, image and video data, a neural network could automatically, in an unsupervised way, learn the concept of a cat. It couldn't name it as a cat, but it learned a cat and, and presumably also a face. So I think this already indicates what can be done with uh, deep learning and a lot of uh, computational power. Um, uh, f so to start off, I, I want to go a little bit uh, back to the, the history of AI. So, uh, so some of my slides actually from uh, Matsusen from the University of Tokyo, and this is uh, one of them. So uh, we can identify the, the three waves of, of AI. The earliest one started with the Dartmouth uh, conference in 90. 56, this was the first uh, international conference on artificial intelligence. At that time, it was more like a computational version of, of mathematics, uh, focusing on, on theory improving, chess playing, and so on. Uh, so I have two winter years. So this is the first winter years. Of course, the term artificial intelligence inspires people. People have high expectations. And in a, in a certain way, these uh, expectations could not uh, be met. There was a, a certain uh, a second AI boom in, in the 80s. This was the time uh, when the expert systems have been built, uh, like uh, Mycene. This is a medical expert systems. And this was also the time when uh, Japan initiated the fifth generation uh, 
computer project with an amount of 50 uh, billion yen funding from uh, METI. Um, this was uh, intelligence uh, to represent knowledge. Uh, what I can say is that it was not considered to be a success in terms of the, it was meant to, to stimulate uh, the industry and become worldwide standard and so on. It was successful, but not the way it uh, was expected to be. So again, winter years. Uh, the third uh, AI boom started uh, around 2006 or more specifically 2013 in the area of uh, machine learning. So. Uh, supported by development of, of web and big data and also uh, computational power. So my uh, today's talk would be mostly on, on the third AI boom and hopefully not leading to the winter years again. Um, here's another slide which uh, shows the chronology of, of some of these uh, systems. You see, uh, mm, let, let's start with the success stories. Uh, Apple's Siri, this personal assistant, is, is supposed to be or seen as a, as a success. This started with a very simple program in the uh, 60s maybe, it was called ELISA. It was like a computational psychologist with an easy knowledge base. You could ask a question and always you, you, you receive an answer. So this went a long way and, and finally Siri considered to be a success. Uh, supported by uh, deep learning. Another one was Mycene and uh, Dendra. This was an expert system in the, in the medical field, uh, which had a certain level of success, but not a huge success. The huge success came with IBM Watson. And, and, and this is uh, another the type of expert system powered by uh, deep learning. And some people say to some extent it can replace uh, the knowledge of uh, doctors. So uh, we have, uh, of course, the, um, the, 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 the search, initial search on, on the lower part here, planning uh, with strips. There was a chess playing deep blue, and, and I think now there, there, are, there are computers who can play the shogi and go at the uh, expert level. This is also a very astonishing fact. And of course, we have the deep learning part, where the, the Google Cat is, can be seen as one of the success, but also we have uh, autonomous cars and, and we have Pepper, so you can meet Pepper several places in Tokyo. So, so this shows uh, the, the history of, of these uh, AI booms. Now, uh, I also tried to find a corresponding version for the deep learning. Uh, deep learning is around uh, for, for many years. It started in the 40s, but not under the name uh, deep learning. It started as uh, cybernetics. And already at that time in, in the 40s, we, they had these, these neural networks, these connected uh, graphs. And initially it was seen to be a, a way to represent human brain. So this was the approach at that time, but didn't work out the way they wanted. Uh, the second term was in the 80s, it was called connectionism. So this was inspired or developed in, in the context of uh, cognitive science, who wanted uh, to uh, understand uh, cognition. And it was seen that uh, a large number of very primitive units could eventually lead to uh, intelligent behavior. And this shows a little bit my history also, because in 1986, actually, I read that book. But I did not predict the success it would have uh, many years later. And then 2006, uh, we have uh, the deep learning. Now, uh, you might uh, ask why the success is coming around now and, and not in the 40s and, and not in the 80s in case of uh, deep learning. So uh, I think there are three uh, important reasons. The first is, is the dramatic increase in, in, in computation and in computational capability. That didn't exist before. Uh, and as you know, these, these uh, neural networks need a huge computation uh, power to train them. And even now, when we have a one training session, it can last for 11 hours on, on a very powerful machines. Uh, the second one is uh, big data. Big data was another of, of these um, exciting uh, terms around uh, now since a couple of years. So we have now an enormous amount of data to input into these models. And also this huge amount of data did not exist 
before. And uh, of course, the recent advances in, in the machine learning algorithm. To give you a sense what, uh, what I mean by uh, computational capabilities and uh, uh, data, big data, uh, I prepared uh, two figures. Uh, the, the first one on the top is from, in, from NVIDIA GPU. You know, the, uh, this is the graphical processing unit which supports the, the parallel uh, computation. So what they are achieving now is more than five teraflops. This is more than five trillion floating point operations per second. So, so I, I printed out the number, so, so it, it's a huge number. So it, it indicates what computational power is available to support uh, and, and enable uh, deep learning. Uh, the other thing is, in, in case of the images, uh, researchers over time build up the, the image net. This, this is a, a, a website with many labeled images. And now they have about 14 million images. So you can download them uh, for your own training and, and get started with, with a deep learning. So, so these have been two important um, factors for making success of deep learning uh, happen now and not before. Computational pow power and uh, lots of data. Um, here's a, a little bit of the, the history in, in, the, in the case of, of uh, mach machine perception. So uh, in this talk, of course, I could talk about the many things. I could talk about natural language processing, or financial data, or weather data, or other kinds of data. Uh, but to stay focused, I, I will look at, at perception. So machines automatically being able to, to recognize uh, objects in, in a scene, a video uh, image, and so on. So here you see the, the little bit of history of the error rate uh, from different approaches. So they started here, this was a 27% uh, error rate uh, by the pre-deep learning uh, types of machine perception work. So basically what, what researchers did, they, they look at images and they said, okay, this could be some basic features and let, let's get started with them and see how they uh, occur in the, and are located and positioned in, in the picture. So now they, uh, they could achieve an, an error rate. I mean, they are improving a little, little by little and uh, could achieve an error rate of, of 26%. And then deep learning cap came in and suddenly error rate uh, dropped to 16%, 10%. So, so uh, you might say this is big or not so big, but if, if, you, if you look at these minimal improvements here and then a sudden improvement of 10%, this was considered uh, quite uh, dramatic. And this happened in 2011. And now I show another slide where what happened after this. So again, we have the 26% on the, on the top. And every year you see new uh, deep learning architectures are being uh, invented and uh, the error rate drops and drops and drops. And maybe uh, the very mm, important uh, step was in February 2015 when the error rate uh, of 5% was achieved. And, and this is uh, the error rate of, uh, of humans. So everything below 5% is beyond human intelligence. So it's better than human intelligence. And so, so as you imagine, you see pictures and you have to identify faces. Sometimes also the humans uh, make a mistake. So when uh, people say uh, deep learning can achieve success beyond human intelligence, it means exactly what it says here. The computer, based on all this uh, data and computational power, has a, a better way to, to recognize objects in a visual scene. So this is uh, what it means here. Now, uh, I want to uh, uh, promote, this is uh, Professor Yutaka Matsuo from the University of Tokyo, and uh, also m my collaborator, and, and he thinks that artificial intelligence uh, is possible, so we have been in the same lab, actually. And, and he's a kind of the face of, of AI and, and deep learning in Japan, and he promotes it very strongly also at the University of Tokyo, also to initiate uh, the new educational 
program because this has been a little bit uh, missing. In fact, uh, Canada is a leader in this field because they didn't care so much the winter years, but they keep, kept the program from, from a long time, just kept, just kept going. Uh, not, not considering whether it was successful, but eventually it was successful. So now I think uh, Matsusen in, in Japan makes this program and trains the many uh, young uh, students also to become the specialist on the deep learning and uh, maybe Toyota doesn't have to promote anymore the Nambusen. Now, um, uh, there are other research centers in, in Japan. Uh, one is the Riken Artificial Intelligence Program uh, uh, Center on Artificial Intelligence, Big Data, Internet of Things, Cybersecurity, those are the, the big terms now. And yeah, they, they put money, at the, the MEXT put money into the center and, and the several researchers are, are working on, on some uh, breakthrough. Uh, there's also the AISD Center, this is a similar concept, but a more, more focused on, on make the collaboration uh, with the industry. So these are the, the Japanese ones, uh, well, academia-oriented industry activities. Uh, Dwango AI Lab is, is building up such a deep learning capabilities. So I talked to them, I think, three or four years ago. At that time, only one person. So now I think they uh, increased the number of uh, researchers. Recruit Institute of Technology focusing on, on improving uh, products uh, and services, also deep learning, and uh, recently also the Honda Innovation Lab in, in Tokyo. Uh, so of course the, the Toyota has uh, funded with $1 billion uh, the, the AI center in, in Silicon Valley actually. And we have uh, more activities here, uh, Nikkei, we have of course uh, IBM Watson recipe launch on the cook pad, high frequency trading and, and the pepper by SoftBank. So th these are all kinds of visible uh, success stories of, of uh, deep learning focusing here on uh, Japan. Um, I also, before I go on, I want to uh, suggest a, a little bit ab about, about the limitations of uh, deep learning and artificial intelligence. So first of all, as I already uh, mentioned, we need vast amounts of data. So if you don't have many data, you, you cannot uh, do it easily. So that's also the reason why uh, US companies like uh, Google and Amazon and Facebook are so powerful because they have all the data. And if you have all the data, you can make uh, very, very powerful models uh, for deep learning. So you need the data. So in, in case of speech, we have a lot of data, image, and but there might be other areas where we don't have so many data. In this case, it's not gonna work very well. Um, currently, also the models you train are only good at one particular task. So you train it to, to recognize uh, certain animals or in Oktama, I will show certain entities there, or in case of autonomous driving, you, you learn uh, the markings and other relevant uh, objects on the street, infrastructure for, for the car. So, but it's always a one, more or less one task. And uh, third, the results, it's working, but it's, it's very hard uh, to, to explain because basically you have this network and the nodes have certain weights and, and you learn a certain uh, weights for this, this network and, and that's it. Yeah? So it's not like an expert system where you had facts and rules and you get some results and then you ask why did you come up with this solution and the system shows you all the, the rules and facts which it used to come up to this solution. So results are a little bit uh, hard to explain. Now, let me move on uh, to, to the content of my presentation, things uh, we have been doing. So uh, I, I'm focusing on the more original things we have been doing rather than talk about uh, the autonomous driving, but you, you can see the many similarities. So we called it uh, situational awareness by drone. It's a semantic segmentation. It's a pixel-wise labeling, object detection, tracking, and human action recognition, and a little bit on infrastructure uh, maintenance by the drone. So let's start with uh, situational awareness uh, by the drone. So uh, it's, today uh, we use the, the data captured by drone, but we are not talking about the drone. So, uh, but uh, uh, luckily we just um, got accepted for the NETO grant. It's a big grant on UTM research platform, unmanned air systems traffic management. 
The leader is uh, JAXA, uh, Japan Aerospace Exploration Agency. And, and we are one of the collaborators with NICT, AISD, and uh, NG. So this is the, the broader context, but not the topic of today's uh, presentation. Uh, now what's a situational awareness from the drone's perspective? Basically, it's, it's the ability to identify objects on the ground and, and, and process them. So this is, I took uh, from the US uh, ghost card. So, so simply, it's, it's knowing what's going on around you. That's situational awareness. Uh, so in, in our case, uh, very simply speaking, uh, the dynamic map is the result of, of a mapping technology where the input is the video feed from the drone and the output is a real-time categorization and tracking of each object and action from the video feed. So that's uh, the simple explanation. And now I want to move on to, to a video which uh, kind of uh, shows uh, such kind of uh, the data collection activity and the video uh, was produced by our uh, collaborator on, on a JST uh, project on big data and disaster from the University of Southern California. I will show this. Aerial videos are the videos recorded from the sky with drones or unmanned aerial vehicles, UAVs. Different from videos recorded on the ground with smartphones or body cams whose field of view is pie-shaped, the spatial coverage of an aerial video is a 3D pyramid and its projection on the ground is a quadrilateral. Different flying rotation angles of drones produce different spatial coverages. This is the coverage with zero pitch and roll angles. If pitching 20 degrees, then it covers more in the pitch direction. If rolling 20 degrees, then it covers more in the roll direction. And this is the coverage with 20 degree pitch and roll at the same time. <coughs> we have collected drone videos collaborating with National Institute of Informatics in Japan under a joint project funded by the U.S. National Science Foundation and Japan Science and Technology Agency. To acquire geometadata such as camera GPS and rotation angles to model the spatial coverage, we collected videos with the IMSC's MediaQ app through a smartphone mounted to the drone. As drone videos can be geotagged every second, we can plot the corresponding 3D spatial coverage continuously as the video is playing. And here we plot the coverage area of all the frames of the video. With the coverage model, we can support spatial queries on the drone videos. For example, range queries. Given a query range cube, it returns the video segment that overlaps with the query cube. All right, yeah, so, so this was uh, some footage how, how we can imagine this uh, data collection activity and uh, we'll look up uh, from, from the database. Uh, now, uh, bef before I show the, the results, I want to indicate uh, some um, services which can be created using such a, a dynamic uh, map. I, I separated in uh, three categories. There's a uh, delivery, uh, traffic, and crowd management, and uh, surveillance, patrolling, and uh, disaster response. So what we are doing with our dynamic map is a foundational uh, technology. It just says which objects there are and where they are. So uh, in case of the like surveillance patrolling, you can imagine that uh, Komatsu has uh, many uh, sites around uh, the world. They might be interested which vehicles are around on their sites and, and what uh, they are doing. So the drone could fly over and investigate exactly this. Uh, there's another case of uh, the uh, traffic engineering. So for instance, in um, Yama, Yama, Yamakuchi, I, I forgot, there, there's an area in Japan where you have a, a sack section. It's, it's like the, the road goes, goes down and this leads to very uh, uh, not so good uh, uh, driving behavior leading to the uh, traffic uh, congestion. In this case, uh, if the drone could automatically capture the trajectories of, of all the uh, vehicles on the ground, it could report back to the traffic engineer, and the traffic engineer has a model how to fine tune the ACC, the automated cruise control, 
to prevent uh, the traffic uh, jam. So this was a discussion I had with a, a professor at the Tokyo University in uh, traffic engineering. And of course, in case of uh, disaster, you can uh, track uh, people, uh, fire, and, and so on. And, and there are other uh, possibilities and, and opportunities uh, you, you might use uh, such a dynamic map, knowing uh, what's going on on the ground. So a 3D map and dynamic map is also done independently by another project in Japan, and that's the, the 3D map uh, uh, creation, mostly for, for autonomous driving. So the difference is that what they create is a 3D shape map. It's static. It does not try to understand the meaning or the, the particular object it is representing. It just cares about the shape. And that makes sense uh, for autonomous driving because the, the car doesn't really care whether this is a stone or, or a fence or something. It just cares there's some object and I should not collide with this object. And, and this is also called uh, 3D map uh, creation. Now, uh, in our case, uh, we had uh, three, we focused on the three topics. The first is uh, semantic segmentation. In this case, we wanted to, to identify uh, the, the type and extension of terrain of relatively large objects. In the second case, object detection and tracking, we are focusing on the more smaller object and, and track them over time. And in the third model, we have been interested to uh, detect actions. So now I'm starting with uh, semantic uh, segmentation. Now it, it gets a little bit more uh, technical or uh, technical oriented. So now, uh, what's semantic segmentation? Um, the input of semantic segmentation is an image uh, from the video. On the left and on the right, you see the semantic segmentation of this scene. So what we do, for each pixel from the input video, we assign it to a particular category, and then for, for the ease of understanding, we have a, a color coding uh, scheme. So for instance, take an easy one. Okay, so we have the building uh, here, and this is color coded in red. We have uh, uh, some trees here, this is color coded in green, and also we have uh, some cars here, and they are color coded in, in blue. So we go from the, the video image to the meaning, the category of, of this uh, image. Now, uh, you might be more familiar with uh, image classification. In this case, we take as input an image or a video, and the output is one particular object. So this can be a, a, a gate part, it can be a motor scooter, a container ship, and so on <coughs> for the picture. What we are interested in, as I said, for each pixel, we want to know what it is. Now, in terms of uh, the, the architectures, we have been looking at several architectures, uh, deep learning architectures, which have been uh, developed over the past uh, several years. And here you see uh, uh, some of the, uh, the most uh, important ones. Uh, here in 2000, 11, uh, you have uh, the, the, the shallow network, you see the error rate is maybe 25%, that's where we, we started off. And over time, literally every year, the error rate goes down. And here we have, uh, if we map it to the left, so maybe 5% error rate. This is what's considered beyond uh, human uh, performance. Uh, at the same time, you see that the depth of the network is, is increasing over time, so there, there are more layers over time. And I think we have here like 150 layers in, in 2015. And a very important factor for deep learning is uh, what's called uh, the hyperparameters. Hyperparameters are very mathematical operations you can apply on, on your network. Now, in order to train your network, you have to fine tune these hyperparameters. Now, the problem is that, for instance, in the uh, case of the network VGG16, uh, in 2014, you have 138 million hyperparameters. So this is a lot of hyperparameters. And it turns out that you need a pretty smart people who understand the, the mathematics behind these hyperparameters and uh, can apply them in a way so that your uh, network can be uh, trained uh, successfully. 
Now, so this was the, some, some architectures. I think we used the ResNet 152. And here on the left, uh, just, just to say it again, uh, if you have an image re recognition task, you input an image and you ask what's, what's on the image. And then maybe the, the, the tabby cat is, is the one with the highest probability among others. If you do pixel-wise labeling, you literally look at each pixel and you see for each pixel, is this more like a cat or more like background uh, and so on. So you can represent it here as a kind of the, the heat map. Now, uh, we opted uh, for uh, a ResNet uh, 152. Uh, the, the reason was it was uh, light, easy to train. Uh, and and uh, very accurate. So we didn't have so many hyperparameters, not not 138 million, but much less, and, and that allowed us to more quickly come up with uh, very uh, the good good solutions. Now, uh, this is uh, the network, a, a deep uh, network. So as I said, you input uh, the image and the output would be uh, the segmentation. And here, I think you have, this is the one with 150 layers. This is this, this neural network. So you, you, you input the image and you, you push it through this network. And that happens incredibly fast. So, so you, we can have push maybe uh, two or three such uh, images per second and get uh, the output uh, done. And what these layers are doing, basically, uh, they extract uh, the basic features. And at the end, they would assign it to one of these uh, categories. So we have a house, uh, uh, vehicle, uh, wood, and, 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 and so on. I'll, I'll show the example later. So, so this is, that's the deep learning part. So the convolutional network means you, you apply for each layer mathematical operations to get to the next layer. And then at the end, you upscale it to retrieve the original image size. And this is a little bit like uh, magic. So I want to show now the concrete example. Uh, here on the top, you have the video feed from the drone in Oktama, just flying over. And in the lower part, you have uh, the result of the, of the deep learning operation. So I will show it in a way so you can easily compare the upper part and, and the lower part. Okay, let's do this here. So yeah, the categories, buildings, um, plants, vehicles, paved ground, unpaved ground, water, structures, people, and others. <coughs> this is not real time, but we can get it in real, almost, almost this speed on, 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 on board of the, of the drone. <coughs> so this is what we call uh, situational awareness. You fly over the land, and in real time, you get a feedback what you see uh, on on the ground. Uh, of course, in this case, uh, we, we can only uh, uh, identify the nine categories which we used uh, to train our model. And, and now I want to show you what it means to train the model. Uh, so we need, as previously mentioned, a lot of data. So we started looking at ImageNet. These are like uh, 14 million uh, images. Uh, labeled images. We have another data set, uh, Pascal VOC, with uh, 20 classes and uh, 10,000 images. There's Microsoft Coco, 80 classes, 150,000 images. So this is already pixel-wise labeled, as, as, you, as you see here. This, they have the, the sheep here and, and the dog here. And uh, uh, this is from Camvit for, for the uh, car. And also there's a Swiss drone data set uh, from, from the aerial view. And uh, we created our own data set, the Octama drone, nine classes and, and 100 images. Yeah, actually a very small amount of, of, of images. But I will see, uh, show you how, how we could use them to get our results. Uh, so first of all, what we, this is Octama. Uh, what we do is uh, data augmentation because the, 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 the number of images we can uh, uh, collect and label is, is comparably small. We use uh, data augmentation techniques, so random crops and random 
flips, so we would just have to make the, the, the model more accurate. So because what, what you want to avoid is that you, you overfit your model, yeah? So you, you have to need some variation in, in your images to, to make a, a rich and, and robust uh, model. Now, uh, the operation we, we used is called fine tuning. So it is impossible to, to start with your own data set and, and make, make the good uh, deep learning model. What people do is they initialize the model with, uh, with a model from, from the, uh, the image net. These are like these uh, 14 million uh, images. So a very obvious question is like, okay, I mean, you, you try to, ident in Octama, identify the buildings and then houses and plants and so on. Maybe these Octama pictures are, are not contained in, in, the, in the image net, which might be on, on cats and, and dogs and, and ships and, and other animals and, and so on. They have 1,000 classes. Now the point is, in deep learning, the lower, the initial level uh, layers, the ones here on the, on the left, are completely independent on your target object. It's completely independent of whether you want to identify uh, cats or buildings or people or, or cars. These are elementary shapes. You, you couldn't name them, you couldn't draw them, but as a matter of fact, uh, these neural networks can learn them and they might be on, on a higher level, might be looking like this. It's just like very elementary shapes. And they are same for all the objects. So now, the reason we can have so good results with such a small number of, of specific Octama data, in our case maybe 100 or 200, is that we can leverage on all these uh, computations or models which have been trained on, on huge amounts of uh, data sets. So if you, if you go straight to the, the cat and the image net has a category cat, you would just uh, take uh, this uh, model and, and you recognize your cat. On the other hand, since we are not interested in cats, but we're interested in houses and uh, cars and, and, and wood, we just use the initial layers, like the, the basic very low level uh, categories from the image net and then fine tune it with our Okta Octama data set. And that worked uh, out pretty well. So one idea is uh, to do the fine uh, tuning here. You see you initi uh, initiate by image net and then you fine tune your model with, with the specific data set. Could be Octama, could be road markings and, and could be anything else. Or uh, use a, a kind of what, what's called a transfer learning. It means you initiate with the image net and then you train on a Swiss drone data set and the Octama and again the Swiss. And so basically, you, the, the more your model has seen, the better it is to actually recognize uh, the objects of interest uh, correctly. Now, another uh, concern we had specifically was that we have been limited in the amount of computational power because our goal was to have the drone fly over the land and do the deep learning on board the drone. Yeah? So this is very different from uh, many other works and, and researches which uh, use the cloud computing and, and very powerful structures to do this. So, of course, if you have enough uh, computational power available, you could just take different models and, and put them together as an ensemble or as, as a group. And then you just look uh, each result and then you say, okay, majority vote if two uh, models say it should be A, let's uh, use A or, or other methods. But this is, is very heavy. Uh, so we can do this on the ground if we have a, a cloud computing, but we cannot do it on the drone itself. So what we did is a, a, a mechanism, it's called model compression. So we, we first have this ensemble and take this ensemble as, as teachers and we train a student model from these teachers. So we, we have the models and train the model on, on, on these uh, three models, which results in a much more lighter uh, model. And, and, and that's what we did. So I will show you soon the results, but before showing the results, I want to introduce you to the, the, the metric of, of object recognition. So if, if you want to say, okay, this is, uh, you want to recognize 
cats, and then you say, okay, it's a cat, so, so this is either uh, correct or, or wrong. But in our case, uh, basically we want to recognize certain regions. So here you have an um, example of uh, the, the stop signal, and then <coughs> the ground truth would be uh, the, the green frame which exactly covers uh, the area of, of this uh, signal board. But maybe what you predict with your deep learning model is, is, is the red uh, box, which, uh, which, doesn't <coughs> which doesn't exactly uh, match the original box. Now, now you, you don't want to say, okay, it's wrong because it's, it's almost correct, but it's not totally correct. So you need a measure how to uh, indicate this. And the metric is called intersection over unit. So on the, uh, on the top part, you have the intersection, and on the bottom, you have the, uh, the union. So obviously, um, if, the, if the, the union gets smaller and the intersection gets bigger, the, the better the result uh, is. So here, this is a poor result, a good result, and an excellent result. So when I show you our results, you please refer to this. I think we have uh, not excellent results, but we have uh, pretty good results. Uh, so this is uh, our result. Um, uh, FCN resonate 152 with uh, skip connection. This is just the name for our model we created. And it is better uh, than the, the, the current uh, best modeler FCN 8. And, and this is the number in the section over union. And in the lower part, you, you have uh, a visual impression of the goodness of the result. So here we compare data augmentation without data augmentation. Uh, here with uh, multi-source training, uh, without multi-source training, and with multi-source training. And uh, for instance, in, in the lower part, you see that uh, if we do the multi-source training, we get significantly better results than if we, we don't do it. And uh, here's a summary of, of results uh, which uh, used our method compared to several other uh, architectures. And you see that our ensemble achieves the, the very good pixel accuracy and uh, mean uh, intersection uh, over unit, 67.6. Uh, uh, and uh, the compressed model is a little bit worse. However, in terms of, of the speed, uh, we, are, we are doing uh, pretty good. And, and for real-time applications, speed is, of course, a, a, a key issue. Okay, so please look at the results. <coughs> now, uh, at that point, we have been uh, quite satisfied. However, we, we noticed uh, certain problems. Mm. One is already the problem in the data set. Uh, so if you look at the, the lower left one, we have a lot of data uh, on background and plants and paved ground, but we have little data uh, on, on people, simply because there are not so many people and they don't show up as frequently as uh, plants or buildings, at least in Oktama. And also, in terms of the pixels, we see that uh, the plants, uh, they have a lot of pixels because there are lots of wood in, in Oktama. On the other hand, the people take up very little pixels. Now, the problem is that since this is a pixel-based uh, approach, if we miss some plant pixels, maybe uh, no problem. But if we miss, miss some other pixels, we might miss the pixels of the people. So we miss out the people. And typically, the people are the most important well, one of the important parts of, of our dynamic map. So this uh, imbalance in the data set and also the problem with, with the, the, the small size of, of the interesting parts uh, leads to, to a, a kind of uh, uh, not optimal results. Now, so my, my group said, okay, we have to overcome this and, and look for some other methods. Uh, and we moved not, not, not moved, I mean, we moved on and added another uh, element and, and model it on object uh, detection. So here we first detect uh, different instances of smaller objects. We assign an ID and then we, we track them. That's called tracking by uh, detection. In order to detect the object, we use uh, an existing model. It's called a single shot 
multiple uh, detector. Again, I, I don't want to go into details, but here on the lower part, you see that uh, there's another network architecture which, which has this uh, capability. And then the, the task is detect, predict, and associate. And then you have a tracking mechanism. So here we first, uh, that, that's from a student from his presentation. Uh, we detect uh, two, two people. Then we predict where they would be moving, in which direction they would be moving. And then we associate uh, the, the pictures between uh, the frames. In this way, we recognize the people and we track them. Uh, so formally, we, for uh, detection, we use this uh, single shot multi-detector. Prediction, we used a Kalman filter. And association was done by Hungarian algorithm. So, so there's some uh, well-known methods to do this. And uh, here I want to show you um, an example, a result from uh, our work. The data set here is a Stanford drawn data set. This was uh, not meant for, for object uh, or people uh, recognition tracking. It was meant to, to analyze some, some social uh, dynamics on, on this campus. But we repurposed it and uh, used it to see how our uh, object recognition, tracking, deep learning model works. There are six classes, pedestrian, biker, skater, car, cart, and, and bus. And I will start it, let's see. You see that we have the bikers here, we have the bikers here with a confidence value and, and we, we follow on them. I mean, of course, you see also we have some mistakes. Sometimes this is this pole, yeah? this is the shot of a pole. They believe it's a pedestrian, but it's, it's not a pedestrian. Yeah? So, so it, it, it's not perfect. But I am always so fascinated if, if I look at such videos where, where you can track people. I think this is uh, fascinating in real time. And also, uh, I, I felt it, it's interesting because the quality of, of this video is actually not, not very good. Yeah, it's actually a low quality uh, video, but still it, it works. So here we have the car now coming. Okay, so this was one video. I think we can move to another video. So this was now uh, in Oktama with uh, some lab members just walking around doing things. And uh, so th this is not a challenging problem, but we, we, we basically just wanted to identify the, the people and, and track them. Yeah? Again, you see it's not perfect. So for instance, this is a person, but he, he's lying. He's, he's uh, sometimes recognized, uh, sometimes uh, not. So this is the, 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 the baseball field. Again, this is a visualization. Deep learning allows you to identify the people. Tracking mechanism allows you to track the people. And, and then we can simply uh, plot the uh, result on, on, our <coughs> on our video. OK, so let's move on with, with uh, this is a, a technical uh, detail, but it turned out to be very interesting because, uh, first of all, we want to recognize and track people, but we also want to know exactly their location. So here we developed a, a, a pixel to GPS mapping. So for each pixel in the, in the video, we can say exactly which GPS location it is. And, and of course, the exact location is, uh, is a very important uh, topic for, for the, the tracking. Now, uh, in our case, it was important to do the deep learning on the drone. It means we have very limited uh, computing uh, capabilities. So here, what you have to the left, this is uh, NVIDIA Jackson TX1. This is a credit card sized uh, chip. And you can embed it on, on the drone. It, it is very powerful. However, it's not as powerful as, as some uh, of this uh, NVIDIA GTX uh, 1080, which you could uh, actually attach to your, 
computer. So we needed uh, to consider in our deep learning work also these limited uh, computing uh, environments. So what we came up uh, as a solution was what's called a multi, multitask uh, training. It means for a, a single network, we use it for two different tasks. So already, you, I, I've shown you this network, so it's the same network. So the first task is the semantic segmentation pixelwise labeling, which I've shown you as part of our previous model. But now, we also repurposed the model to also be able to detect uh, the objects. So we have a shared representation, we have shared computation, but we have improved generalization in terms of that we can grab certain layers and, and push them into a different model to do the uh, object uh, detection simultaneously uh, to the semantic uh, segmentation. So uh, to, to show you this in, in numbers, what it means and why it is important, uh, here in, in this uh, chart on the top, we have the FCN skip. This was the semantic segmentation. It uses more than two uh, gigabyte memory and it take, uh, takes about 96 milliseconds for the common layers and 11 milliseconds for specific layers, so in total 80 milliseconds. Now the SSD, this is the, the single uh, shot uh, multi-object detector, also takes the two gigabyte um, memory and for the common layers, again, 69 uh, milliseconds, 8 milliseconds for the specific layers, and total 77 milliseconds. Now, if we would do this in, in, in parallel, uh, we would use more than four uh, gigabyte. And if we do it sequentially, we would use uh, 157 uh, milliseconds, which is a long time if you consider real-time uh, performance. Now, in our multitask network, since we share the common layers, we have, again, 69 milliseconds for the, for the shared layers, but then we just divide up in the specific layers, so 11 milliseconds, but 8 milliseconds is 90 milliseconds, so we uh, uh, achieve 88 milliseconds as compared to 157 uh, milliseconds, and also in memory usage, and that's the important figure, we have a little over two gigabyte and not over four gigabyte. Problem is, if it's more than over four gigabyte, uh, it doesn't fit on, on, on your, on your uh, uh, super chip anymore, yeah. Sorry, this is <laughs> technically, but in a deep learning, this is always the trade-off. You have the rich model, you need a rich computing facility, or you have a more slim model and you can fit them on the, on, on the real-time uh, performance embedded environments. Now, uh, here I would like now go on for the, the third model. This is on human action recognition which I personally think is rather fascinating because what you see here, and that's a kind of uh, situational awareness. You have people here, in real time, you recognize them, you track them, and you also tell what they are doing. Yeah? So they are now walking, reading, uh, walking, reading, pulling, pushing, all kinds of things in, in, in real time. So uh, th this was, uh, I got a very uh, yeah, good feedback from, from the security companies in Japan, but they, they thought that this is very advanced because what they have is actually not very advanced. I was surprised. So it looks like a perfect tool to do the surveillance. Uh, on the other hand, uh, surveillance and security companies in, in Japan are, are not so cooperative, so uh, we couldn't activate it. But anyway, this is human action recognition, and let me show a little bit more on how we uh, moved on that project. Uh, first of all, uh, first of all, it, it's, it's always the data set. So if, if you do the machine learning, either you take the web or existing data sets, or you have to create your, your new data set. And, and that's what makes our work uh, special although there are hundreds of other deep learning groups in, in, in the world, is that we take the aerial perspective. And when we reviewed existing data sets, we noticed that none of them uh, actually considered the aerial view. So there are lots of data sets, but not on the aerial view. And we took the aerial view. Yeah? So we have a diversity of actions. 
uh, multi-purpose uh, data set action detection, human, multi-human uh, tracking. And what makes the aerial view so, so interesting is compared to a fixed camera. So there are many fixed cameras at stations and everywhere, is that we have camera motion movement, we have different viewpoint and scale, we have uh, different lightning conditions, uh, we have partial and full uh, occlusion, we have different altitudes, different pitch and, and roll and, and, and so on. So you see, this is a very uh, diverse uh, types of, of, of input and the model has to be robust enough to detect uh, the, the target also, if, if the lightning condition is a little bit different, if the, the camera angle is a little bit different, if the altitude is a little bit different, and so on. Anyway, uh, our aim was uh, to recognize uh, 13 actions, human to object action, like reading, carrying, calling, uh, non-interaction, walking, lying, running, sitting, standing, and, and human to human interaction, like hugging or, or handshaking. So these have been our not random, but our, our choice of actions. And on the lower part, you see uh, the model uh, we used. Now, uh, I, let me talk about data collection. This is something where, where we learned, uh, unexpectedly learned something interesting. So, uh, of course, we can go to the field and we take the drone and, and we collect all the videos. But then you, you have to find someone who would look frame by frame and they would draw a rectangle around it and would also say, hey, this is standing, this is walking, or, or something else. So this is a, a very time-intensive uh, activity, and I think we had uh, 77,000 uh, frames. So, so we, we ask a company and, and say, okay, you know, could, could you label that for us because my, my students won't do that. And, and, and they came up with, um, uh, estimate. So, but the estimate was really high, so I said, oh, I, I cannot pay that. So we did something. We went to Emerson Mechanical Turk, and so we prepared the data set, and we gave it to Emerson Mechanical Turk, and we said, okay, so please make rectangles about, around people, and, and in the second group, uh, uh, please say what they are doing. The astonishing thing was that we could achieve the whole data set labeled, in less than one week, and we paid about Rokomayen. <laughs> this is a very small amount of, of money, actually, as compared to almost like the 10 times higher uh, estimation uh, from, from the company. So, so this is now, maybe it, it doesn't concern you too much, but as you know, there are, there's this uh, crowdsourcing activities. If you have some simple task and, and you want uh, to have things labeled, such as uh, images or sentences for the emotional content, you can push it to a crowdsourcing uh, company, and, and some people around the world, we don't know where they are, would actually be interested to do this. So in this case, we found a very scalable way to get our data uh, annotated. Now, in terms of uh, the statistics, uh, this is always important if you have a, a deep learning project, you need to know the statistics of your uh, data set. So for walking, we have, uh, <coughs> let me see. Mm. This is the number of samples. So we have a bunch of samples also standing. We have a bunch of samples running and lying. We, we have less samples. So anyway, so it, it is not completely balanced and, and that has to be uh, taken into consideration for the uh, quality of your model as well. Anyway, uh, we had uh, this detection. I think I showed you another video on this. I think this is an improved version of, of, of the one I, I, I previously shown you. And uh, I think the, the drone flew maybe 30 meters above ground. And uh, yeah, well, um, of course, the, you can have more powerful drones and more powerful cameras and then they fly higher and you don't see them anymore and you can check up on what's, what's going on on the ground. 
I felt it interesting because before in, in, in the IT field, we have been so much fascinated that people had smartphones and they walk around with a smartphone and, and we can trace them where they are going and, and just uh, ma make some <coughs> extrapolation on, on, on their movement and these dynamics. And now with uh, deep learning, it's not only their precision, we can also say what they are doing while they are uh, moving around in, in, in the world. And uh, I think then the next video is special in terms of this is real time. This is literally on the drone. So we didn't try to, to smoothen it. But this is now a drone flying with a credit card sized uh, super chip on the drone. And it would do the, oh, wait a moment. This is, oh, wait a moment. OK, not that, that's, not the, that's not the real time. That, that's another one of the uh, trucking one. Pushing, pulling. I, I hope you can see it. Okay, I think we have seen some. I, I think I wanted to show the real time one. Okay, here we go. So, without any optimization, uh, two frames per second. So, that's considered to be real time. If it's less than one frame per second, more than one frame per second, it's considered to be real time. And, and that's what we can do on the drone. Yeah, so, so this is, uh, I have a little bit more now on the infrastructure maintenance, but this, this concludes what, what we had on, on deep learning uh, by, for the image and, and video uh, processing. Okay, I think you got the, the point of this. Let me move on. This is just a few slides on, on a, a new project we, we just started uh, with uh, uh, Japanese consulting companies. It's on infrastructure maintenance uh, by drone. And uh, I, I felt that the, the human action recognition was kind of exciting and people like students got very enthusiastic about it because we can just, uh, you know, you know, the, you know, look, look what people are doing. Uh, so compared to that, the infrastructure maintenance is, is uh, not so exciting and the data are not so exciting, but generally I think it's maybe more exciting <laughs> and it was more easier to connect to, to Japanese companies on that. As you know, the, uh, the, in Japan, most of the infrastructures have been built in, in the 60s and uh, to, the, to the 80s. But now recently the, the infrastructure Goes, goes down, there's a, a level of uh, degradation. So the, the, the maintenance cost and the repair cost and, and the, the, the problem of maybe have a, a serious accident like a, the, the bridge collapses is a very, very important uh, social uh, problem. So in terms of uh, the drone, I think this was so-called white asset um, infrastructures are very convenient like uh, power lines, bridges, roads and, and even dam, yeah? because you cannot just have people walking along, so the drone comes in uh, very handy. So what makes the thing uh, very relevant is that uh, it is expected to have 180 trillion yen over the coming 50 years in terms of repair costs, that's a lot. And uh, we noticed the, 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 <laughs> the infrastructure people. Uh, la notice the lack of, of qualified people to do the, the inspection. So this leads to a subjective and, and inconsistent uh, evaluation of, of the level of degradation. So therefore, we need a cost-effective, reliable, and effective solution for infrastructure inspection and maintenance. And I think this is where the drone comes in. Uh, on the top left, this is actually our, our drone we are using. It's a general purpose drone, but it's not so perfect for the infrastructure because uh, if you go uh, over the, the street or the, the baseball field, you have a no problem. But if you do the infrastructure inspection, like a bridge, these are very complex. So, so the, our drone cannot do it. So we are now talking to Denso, for instance, you know, the car parts maker. They make their own drone for infrastructure inspection. And there's also a, a project at uh, Tohoku University with, with such a sphere around it so that it, it wouldn't crush. Now, uh, the idea is that we have the, the drone fly close to the infrastructure and it would in real time uh, 
classify the type and level of, of degradation and report it down uh, to the, the on-site uh, inspector. And the on-site inspector can compare this classification as a, as a gold standard classification to his or her own classification and, and maybe initiate uh, some further investigation if there is a, a need for it. And um, uh, concretely, we, we have uh, access to uh, 100,000, more than 100,000 images from 14,000 uh, bridges in the Niigata uh, prefecture. And uh, so I learned that the bridges are very uh, complex entities actually. And, and uh, yeah, so here you have some of the entities and this is uh, just a one e example of a rebar corrosion on the deck and the abutment. And then there are different uh, levels uh, of, of degradation. Um, and our task now is uh, to take these images. So we have, this is just an example. Yeah? A, A means no problem. C, D, E, E is the worst. Yeah? This is a rebar corrosion on the deck and here's a rebar corrosion on the abutment. And, and we have all these data. And our job is now to learn a model so that we can automatically classify the damage level of, of uh, this uh, infrastructure in real time using the drone. This is now our uh, task and effectively this can be a, an important solution. We, we have the client scenarios, data collection uh, by drone, uh, the, the deep learning artificial intelligence part by automatically recognizing the damage part and then uh, finally is what's called Predictive maintenance, it means you uh, determine the optimal time in the future when a certain entity uh, should be uh, repaired. So this is uh, just starting now and, and maybe I can show in the future. Uh, so to, to summarize, yeah, so as I tried to demonstrate, uh, deep learning performs extremely well on specified, well-specified uh, tasks such as uh, object recognition. And it's tremendously successful in, as an academic discipline and also industry. So before we say, oh, how about using this, but they are not using, but now deep learning and artificial intelligence is accepted by the industry. And uh, many of the companies, bigger ones and smaller ones, create AI centers up to the level of $1 billion in case of uh, uh, Toyota. Um, in the in, uh, case of, of Japan, I, I think they, they have not been moving uh, so much fast, yeah? but uh, maybe no problem because there is the one uh, quote from Chil Pratt. Actually, he is the, the guy, the director of, of the Toyota Artificial Intelligence uh, Institute in, in, uh, in, in Silicon Valley. And, and they asked him, oh, you know, Toyota started with the autonomous driving rather late. And, and he said, yeah, yeah, don't worry. We are not the end of the race, we are the beginning of the race. Yeah? So there's enough time to, to be the leader still. And uh, so my, my personal uh, suggestion is in uh, uh, this case, so to avoid the, the, the winter years again, uh, not to make uh, people expect too much on what AI uh, deep learning can do, but just say what it can do well and, and promote that. Yeah, so this is, uh, so the, I have some of the core collaborators and also Matsu-sen from Tokyo University. Yeah, thank you very much, thank you very much. Before we start the uh, discussion, uh, it's better to introduce uh, Professor Pradinga first because in the oh. beginning, I should do that. Uh, professor Berdinger uh, is a professor at the National Institute of, Institute of Informatics, located in Kanda area. And uh, he works in the digital content and media science research division, and uh, artificial intelligence and human machine interaction and cyber physical system. So, you can get uh, his uh, background at, the home, at his home page. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, additional sort introduction? Well, no, I think that's sufficient. <laughs> okay, so Q&A session. And uh, first I wish to...
raise a question. Why do you call deep learning? Ah, okay. Yeah, so, you know, many of these uh, terms are kind of catchwords to, to make people, inspire people. It's like big data. So, so um, okay. Um, the networks, okay, now let's go to the very beginning, I think. Okay. These are neural networks and and here on the left we, we have the, the very the basic uh, low abstract uh, uh, units like maybe just a pixel or basic shapes and then we abstract them more and more and more and more to the higher level more abstract concept like cut. It's called deep learning because of the depth of the network. Yeah? So we, this is of course just a schematic, but we in principle can count one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Yeah. So this this is new. So the the the, the shallow representation is if you say okay, if it rains, the streets are wet, yeah? and now the, the streets are wet, and maybe it rained. It's just a one cause effect. Yeah? But here we have all, all these units and and maybe kind of represents like, like the, the brain structure, but, but this is actually not, not the topic uh, of, of, of my presentation. So the reason to call it deep learning is that people found out if they have a huge amount of data and they have a very deep models, then uh, they can be very successful to eventually uh, arrive at, at higher level concepts like, such as a cat. So to say it simply, if, if your network is very shallow, you have uh, some pixels on the image and, and, and then you have the cut, but there is uh, no connection. Yeah? <laughs> so on the other hand, if you have some pixels and then you group the pixels and you figure out, oh, uh, maybe in this area there are more the eyes and the eyes in here. So, so the, the, the many layers give you the more opportunity to arrive at more abstract objects. And of course the cut is very abstract already, but it can move on if we have a scenery with, with cats and dogs and, and other animals. It, it could be like a zoo, could be a very abstract uh, concept. So simply speaking, it turned out if we use the more layers, we have a better possibility to learn and identify abstract objects such as, as a cut. So my, uh, the, the, the networks we have been using, the light ones has 50 layers, but we also have one with 100 layers and 150 layers. So maybe you think it's not so deep, but still, uh, since you have to train the model, it, it's a very time consuming. So this is actually the, uh, one of the bottlenecks. If, if you can, cannot afford the computing uh, power, then you cannot train your model. But anyway, so that, that's the reason for deep learning. Initially cybernetics, then connectionism, yeah, because uh, they're kind of connected units, yeah? <laughs> and, and then deep learning. And deep learning worked out as a, con as a flashy. Uh, thank you for your presentation. Thank you. Uh, I have a question. Uh, do you use some uh, deep learning uh, module like TensorFlow while you programming with Scratch, with like Python? Yeah, okay. So. In, in the laboratory, um, you know, I am not very strict to say, please do this or that. So it, it seems uh, we, uh, many of the students have been very comfortable with CAFE. CAFE, that the CAFE is, is one of these frameworks. And so um, for that reason, we used CAFE. <laughs> so there was a no deep investigation uh, and people just came up and had uh, some past experience and, and they felt comfortable. And, uh, uh, you know, Python, yes, uh, I think initially we thought Python is another good choice because it's a kind of a scripting languages and, and we are in the, we are in the real time business actually. Yeah? You have a super chip on the drone, you push a video in, 
and, and walks through I and mean, pushes through the network 50 or 100 layers and, and need the result in less than a second. Uh, so, but uh, already Python also has the very uh, powerful real-time libraries, so also use, use the Python. Yes, so uh, if we have to achieve some uh, target of uh, objective, uh, we have to use uh, both uh, some uh, modules like CAFE and the uh, right Python with in Scratch. Or uh, we, in we Scratch, do you mean from Scr Scratch? Uh, or from Scratch, um, yeah. Um, all right. Uh, so, uh, my <laughs> I, I'm not personally <laughs> actually using the tools. Uh, so, the, I, th I think uh, the, the, um, what, what is kind of fascinating in this deep learning field is that everything is open. Everyone can use everything. So, when I talk to the companies, uh, they always say, oh, do you have a patent on that? Or what's the patent? I say, no. You can download, everyone can download it from the web. Yeah? So the response, and, and that's kind of fascinating and, and not well understood because the point, okay, to answer your question, um, I, I think that the CAFE and, and all the TensorFlow and, and uh, these, these frameworks are promoted by, by the big companies or universities to, to make them very user friendly and already they integrate the many functions. Yeah? So you don't have to do that that much by yourself. And also, the data set is also available. Yeah? And, and in case of our Oktama action data set, we put it out there, everyone can use. So uh, in, in our case, uh, we, we hope we get many citations uh, about our data set. So it's very easy to get going on, on the deep learning because everyone, including the Google and, and all these groups, are happy to give you their architecture, their model, everything they give to you. Yeah? The trick is that to use the model, you have to be really, really expert and smart and, and committed to use the model. Because as, as I mentioned, all these hyperparameters are not so easy to understand. Yeah? Some sigmoidal functions and, and some maximum pooling and medium pool. It's, it's not so intuitive, right? And uh, so I am not sure whether I answered your question, but it's all there. You can use anything. Everyone is going to help you. <laughs> Thank you. Hi. The AI, uh, what? Ah, okay. All right. Okay. So, so my okay, my take on this is, I think um, maybe, <laughs> um, maybe my presentation is maybe not the most exciting presentation for some people. There are ma much more exciting presentations like uh, how robots take over the world and, and how they became more intelligent and uh, even people like, uh, I don't know, Elon Musk and, and uh, Mark Zuckerberg have maybe interesting discussions on whether they take away our jobs and, and they kill us or everyone. So I think th this is not my business. Yeah? So, so um, I, I can say nothing meaningful a a about it. So I, I, in my presentation, and I think such a discussion leads to, I don't know, um, that, that's totally fine, but it, it's not what I'm interested in. What I'm interested in is doing the task really, really well. Yeah? And um, of course, you can imagine uh, that uh, image recognition is uh, just a one thing, yeah? a one tiny thing. Yeah? So uh, in, in the future, I, I think what, what's, uh, or in the near future, what's happening maybe at Toyota even, is that they completely automatize the whole production plant. Yeah? Because recognizing a cart or recognizing a plant or a human is, is maybe conceivable. Yeah? But in, in, a, in, a, in a construction plant, 
where you still need the humans is, is like these little screws and, and you have to fiddle them into the car in some way. And, and the human can very easily manipulate it and do it. But with a deep learning, if, if you keep this whole process going and going and going, eventually also the, 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 human, the, 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 the machine, the, the, the robot could do it. And, and the same is maybe true for medicine operations and, and, and so on. So I, I think this is the, the way I, I see the, uh, the future. Currently just improving on some, something which happens already very good. Right. Um, so I think what's certainly true is is that uh, some mm, some jobs can be done better by computers uh, than than by humans, but I, I'm not sure whether these jobs are necessarily the ones humans want to do. I, I I'm not sure. I think it it could shift from. <coughs> What we do in the drones uh, is like it's called supervisory control. Yeah, so you don't personally control the drone; uh, it just supervises uh, the, the operation of the drone. In in case of of the the, the plants, the, the construction plants, similar things can happen. That that people who previously screwed some uh, I don't know screws in into the car, whichever, now w would be supervising the operations of 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 of, of drones. You mean the deep learning model? Right. So, so I mean to. Uh, okay. okay that, that's it, it, that's a good question. Okay. Okay. So, what we <coughs> what 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 we did is that. Oh, okay. Okay. Um, uh, for, first of all, we used a light model. You know, you uh, it. it it's always um, a little bit of trade-off. So for instance, if you have 150 layers, it's not so light, but you can reduce it to 100 layers and, and 50 layers. And, and what we observed is even with 50 layers, so not so deep, yeah, more shallow network. Yeah? The deeper the better maybe, but it needs too much computation power. But even a shallow network can do pretty well. So we, we can reduce the, you can do anything, yeah? So we reduced the layers to 50 layers, and it, it was good enough. It was light, yeah? Uh, so we can put it on the super chip. It was accurate enough, and it was uh, easy to train. And a more, another technical solution was that, that we used, a, uh, we, we look at the several uh, very heavy models, yeah, and, and we don't have the computing uh, power to, to handle all these heavy models, the, the ensemble. So in a, in a knowledge distillation phase, we say, okay, here are some models, and now these are like the teachers for, for the student. And the, the student listens to all the teachers what they say, and, and they just make their own model by listening to all the teachers. And we have, here we have three teachers, yeah, and there is very heavy, but uh, we can learn uh, one student models from three teacher models, and, and these student models sort of encodes or captures all, all the variation and, and knowledge of, of, of the teachers, and again, it's, it's a more light model. So the, of course, this is a very time-dependent uh, discussion. Uh, because, the, as you know, the NVIDIA is a very uh, aggressive company. So, so every six months, they, they double the cap capacity. Uh, so sometimes we just sit and wait until they catch up with the computing power. But technically, th this is a, a solution.
Thank you very much. Uh, I was actually relieved to hear someone relay, um, working on AI say at the end, let's not over expect what we, what we can do with AI and just promote what he can do. Mm -hmm. I was actually relieved to hear someone say that. Um, so thank you very much. But my question is, um, and I was actually surprised how much, how deep the history is of the attempts to get um, artificial intelligence going. But now, because it's come to an era where it, it has now gone into practical use and the actual realization of having robots do um, human jobs is an actual reality. Um, I feel that there is uh, a need for some sort of control or ethical control of what um, what what sort of data and um, technology can be used. And uh, you mentioned with the other question that uh, a lot of the plat um, the data is like open for use online, and it's right. pretty much open for a lot of people to be freely used. Um, and obviously, from an engineering point of view, I guess that those people who want to use the data don't want it to be controlled because obviously they want more access to it. Mm -hmm. um, and the people who are going to have the legal control over will have to be someone in the government or anything that mm -hmm. probably doesn't have actual professional knowledge of how to control these. So it's, it's kind of a, who do you think, I feel that the engineers should be, should come to a point where they need to control themselves. But do you think that there will come an age where that will right. happen? Or? Yeah, I think, uh, okay, <laughs> so there's the RECAN AIP Center, and, and one part is also conducts research on ethical, legal, and social issues called, uh, caused by the, the spread of AI. I think even Matsu-san uh, is maybe lead, leading uh, this field. So, so when I say that the data are all open, uh, and then the architectures and, and, and the models even, uh, this is a more, you know, uh, uh, of course, the YouTube is already on there, the web is there, so you can download everything. And, and people, researchers, they want to have increased the impact by making their data available. But of course, these data are, are not very sensitive uh, data. So th this is more, more generic. Our, also, our data are not very sensitive data. Uh, it, it, this discussion relates a little bit to the big data discussion. So in, in Japan, uh, I think several years ago, they came up with um, promoting big data, and it was called the program that cannot fail. Yeah, I, I found that was an interesting title, almost implying, now please believe us, it's, it's not going to fail. Yeah? I, I think, as I mentioned, the fifth generation project still is on their mind because they failed or they thought they failed, and, and failure is not what they don't want or want to avoid. And in, in case of the big data, we, we noticed that from the IT perspective, we could do hilarious things with this big data, but we never accessed big data. And uh, I don't know. You know, the companies, maybe Toyota, they, they don't care these flashy keywords. Maybe they are doing it already <laughs> because they have a lot of data. At least they have all the data of the Toyota cars going around and they can predict the traffic. And, and, and so on. So um, maybe I'm, I'm not the best one to answer your, your question, but I at least can, can point to the, the RECAN AIP Center and, and uh, under MEXT, they have one section and one group is, is dedicated uh, to, to this part. The other thing is company internally use the data and, and the power of Google and all these US companies is that they give you everything for free. They just say, just use it, just use it, just use it. They don't care. They don't sell you the, the, the Google map and they don't sell you the, the Gmail or anything. They just say, use it. And many people use it because it's so convenient. But what in return, they know everything about you. I mean, they know everything about the Google users, right? And this gives them an enormous uh, amount of power and, and knowledge uh, of, of, pe of people's uh, very uh, private uh, things. And yes, I, I think there are some, uh, at least in the European Union, I, I think they, they are watching that. And, and maybe that's all I can see on, on that. But uh, it's very important. I just cannot give a really good answer, I think. I, I understand about the ethical, and, and thank you for that, about the ethical use of uh, data, but also the ethical use of the technology as well. I mean, I understand for research purposes, for, for example, the object recognition, mm -hmm. um, trying to improve that. I think there will be very beneficial uses for that in certain areas, for, I don't know, for like medical or uh, in certain ways, I guess in surveillance, mm -hmm. in certain ways. But it, 
it could also be used in very, I guess, bad ways, for example. Do you think it's, in, it's up to the engineers or the people who develop the technology to try and control how it is used or how, wh 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 which places the technology is, um, I guess, um, permitted for use or? Yeah, so um, I, you're right. <laughs> There are, uh, you, you can use it for other, and, and people are doing this already. It, it's, it's well known. You, you can have machines very high up in the air and have very powerful cameras, they can do the same thing, yeah? So, mm. so, um, so of course, the, in, in case of artificial intelligence, it always can also be used for, for, for other uses non-civilian uses, that, that's, 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 that's true. I, I just cannot give you the framework how to separate and how to prevent, that's why I cannot give. Thank you very much for your uh, presentation. I have a question about regarding uh, privacy issue. Uh, because recently, uh, Google DeepMind uh, in UK is facing with uh, uh, some kind of, of, of failure of, of data privacy issue uh, due to uh, uh, insufficient explanation regarding informed consent mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Which, uh, to the targeting a uh, patient. So in those cases, maybe it's, it's, very, uh, it's not so, it, it is not so easy to explain or, uh, 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 technology of AI to uh, general people. Right. But however, so in, in many cases, it's, uh, it, uh, we have to do the, in the past, we have to uh, get uh, uh, informed consent from patients or general people. So do you think the process? Yeah, so, so I, I, I totally agree that this is a very important uh, issue. Uh, it's maybe a little bit separate from artificial intelligence and deep learning. However, it's definitely related to what I'm showing you, yeah? Because I show you real people doing things, yeah? And already this can be seen as a violation of, of, of privacy. Um, I, I was very surprised. Uh, just uh, three days ago, I received the, the, the email from, from Amazon Prime Air. I'm, you know, Prime Air was supposed to be this delivery service by, by Amazon. And they say, oh, you know, we just saw your Oktama action data set, and that's very interesting. Can we use it? Yeah? And, and I thought, why, why am I asking this question? Because it, it's there anyway. And, and then I look, who is it exactly? It was a lawyer <laughs> from Amazon Prime. It was not as usually I get a research inquiries, yeah? but he was a lawyer. Yeah? So, and, and uh, so I, I, f I, I had some feelings like, like this. Yeah? I thought, oh, okay. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. This might be the introduction to us, and uh, we wish to continue this kind of the discussion further uh, because of the progress is qui very quick, and the uh, Oktama project is working, and, yeah. and, and we will have the, uh, another opportunity to know uh, what he is doing. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Five minutes off and the coffee is ready and uh, please pick it up. <laughs>